You want a war? You're gonna get one. Now get the gun! Welcome back to Reliving the War. It's the 11th of January 1999 and this week we've got WWF Raw coming from Houston, Texas while WCW Nitro takes place in Knoxville, Tennessee. A quick heads up, if you didn't watch the special episode of Reliving the War that covers the 7th of January edition of WCW Thunder, I'd urge you to take a look at that upload before continuing on here. Thunder had some significant moments in regards to WCW storylines moving forward, so please check that video out and treat it like any other episode of Reliving the War. I'm putting together this video you're watching now with the assumption that you know what happened on Thunder. This week's Jam Up Guy is Darian. Darian met Jeff Hardy while wearing his Super Chin Locks 2 Turbo shirt. Jeff Hardy was playing an acoustic set on this evening while Darian was applying devastating chin locks to random folks in the audience. Thank you very much for sending in your picture man and thank you for supporting the show. Episode 168 of Reliving the War. Let's do it. Nitro kicks off this week with a Ric Flair promo. Before confirming that he and his son David will definitely be teaming up this Sunday at Sold Out, the Nature Boy delivers some good news and some bad news for Hulk Hogan. Ted Turner, Harvey Schiller and Ric Flair had their meeting as promised and the good news for Hulk is that Hollywood is the world champion and the result of the finger poke of doom incident can't be changed. The bad news is Hulk Hogan's locked in a WCW contract until 2001 and Hogan's days of running for president and making movies are over. Hogan works for Ric Flair and the nature boy isn't going to make life easy for the world heavyweight champ. Flair noticed that someone was missing during this meeting he had with Turner and Schiller, a good friend of his who Rick wants to bring back to Nitro. So here he is, James J. Bebe Dillon has been reinstated as chairman of the WCW executive committee. Dillon says Hogan's next title defense will be at Super Brawl 9, so yeah, after Flair saying he's gonna put Hogan to work we still have to wait over a month for Hulk to defend that title of his. And what's more, neither Dylan nor Flair have decided who Hogan's opponent's gonna be. In regards to Sold Out, however, the boys have come up with a main event that they think's gonna please the great fans of WCW. Scott Hall vs Goldberg. It's a ladder match where a cattle prod will be suspended high above the ring. Whoever grabs the cattle prod can use it legally to zap their opponent. So join me this Sunday and we'll see what happens in that match. Flair has two more orders of business. He calls out the LWO and he says Eddie Guerrero got his leg broke by Hall, Nash, Hogan and the rest of the boys. In reality, Eddie was involved in a car crash and he's been written off TV so he can recuperate. Flair wants the LWO to give up their shirts and join WCW once again. Flair knows Bischoff promised these guys the world and they aren't getting paid correctly. So not only does Flair promise the LWO the money they're owed, they're also promised cars, women and all that good stuff. Without hesitation, the LWO take their colors off and they disband in the middle of the ring. Surprisingly, Rey Mysterio does not give up his shirt. This is interesting seeing as Rey wanted to leave the group for so long but maybe he's not happy with being bought out like this. Finally, Ric Flair books himself in a match tonight. Flair vs Kurt Hennig one more time. That match takes place later in the evening and Ric says Kurt has no say in the matter. The former Mr. Perfect must fight the president of WCW tonight on Nitro. Perry Saturn vs Ernest Miller is our first match and not even joking, this is the only match that takes place in the first hour of Nitro. Perry got interviewed before the bout and he said Jericho and Scott Dickinson have been screwing him over as of late. So Saturn calls Jericho out and Perry wants to fight. The way Chris sees it, he's already beaten Perry and Chris has no reason to fight this crybaby again. Saturn cries like a 10 year old schoolgirl and really, Saturn should be out here wearing a dress judging by the way he's getting on. Chris then gets an 
idea. He says he will give Perry a match after all, but if Saturn loses, then he'll have to wear a dress for the remainder of his career. Saturn says no at first, but Jericho manages to talk him into it. Saturn says he won't lose, but Mean Gene thinks Perry just made a big mistake. Scott Dickinson refereed the Saturn vs Miller match and it didn't take long at all for the referee to put his hands on Perry. Dickinson also let Miller get away with a low blow and he seemed oblivious as Sonny Ono attacked Saturn on the outside. As expected though, Perry fought back and he was able to hit Miller with a frog splash. Saturn had the match won, but Dickinson got distracted by Ono while Chris Jericho runs down to hit Perry with a shovel. Saturn falls into the referee, so Scott awards the match to Ernest Miller while Chris continues beating down Perry. It ends with Chris trying to put a pretty little dress on Saturn and Jericho fails miserably. We then get taken to some pre-recorded footage of Eric Bischoff getting summoned to Ric Flair's office in Atlanta. Eric sees Red when he realizes he isn't getting any kind of special treatment upon entering the building and he's even more pissed off when Flair keeps him waiting at the reception area. Flair's taken over Eric's office and Flair reminds Bischoff that this is now the Nature Boy's workplace, not Bischoff's living room. Flair noticed that Eric came out of his shell a little last week on commentary during the finger poke of doom. Bischoff said yeah, it was pretty awesome but he had nothing to do with what went down in the Georgia Dome. So Rick's gonna make Eric's life as miserable as possible. He's packed up Eric's belongings that he left around the office including this sick NWO mouse pad and Eric gets brought outside to receive his first assignment. In that truck is the WCW wrestling ring and Bischoff's heading to Knoxville to set the ring up. Bischoff can't believe it but Flair thinks this is a great little job for Eric to complete this week. The truck's absolutely filthy but Bischoff has no choice. So we'll check in with Eric again later and we'll see the executive producer getting his hands dirty while setting up the ring. It's Pepe's birthday today folks and Chavo wants to celebrate. We have a sold out arena singing happy birthday to a hobby horse ladies and gents but someone's here to crush the party. Norman Smiley wants to join in on the celebration, he wants to let bygones be bygones. And to prove this, Norman Smiley wants to shake Chavo's hand. Even though Norman says he's actually a nice guy, Chavo isn't buying it. So no, Chavo won't shake Norman's hand, but Pepe, however, would be happy too. So Norman takes Pepe and Chavo gets taken out. Didn't see that one coming. Chavo gets his head smashed into Pepe's birthday cake. Norman performs the smiley slam and look, I am the table. Norman then steals Pepe before heading to the back and after a commercial break, Norman kills Chavo's horse by throwing it into a wood chipper. This is possibly the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. And Chavo screaming afterwards is really the icing on the cake. I must have watched this about 5 times and it just got more and more funny with every view on poor poor Chavo. We say goodbye to another reliving the war legend this week, rest in peace Pepe. The Sandman aka Jim is still hanging out with Raven back in Florida and the boys are playing a game of backgammon, serious business. Jim thinks that Raven should ditch Kenyon but Raven seems more concerned about finding his school yearbook. Mummy Raven says all his stuff's been put away and as Raven looks through his old junk he finds pictures of Roddy Piper. Was Raven a fan of Piper as a kid or does this have some other meaning? The NWO elite arrived at Monday Nitro while Raw begins with a McFoley promo. D-Generation X come out to the stage to introduce fans to the new WWF champion. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. Shut up. Mick Foley comes out to a brand new theme song, Billy Gunn's got one word for the audience tonight and that's Socko, and Mick gets in the ring and he says it's about time the WWF gave him some new entrance music. Vince, Shane and The Rock watch on backstage as Mankind says last week was the greatest moment of his entire career. For years and years Mick would call the WWF looking for a job but he would never hear back from the company because he didn't look like a superstar. But there was one person who knew Mick was a star and that man is Jim Ross. So Foley thanks Jim who's watching at home and Mick can't wait for Jim to call one of his championship matches. 
Mankind understands he didn't win the championship on his own last week, so Foley thanks DX and he also thanks Stone Cold Steve Austin. The crowd popped huge when Mick mentioned Austin's name. Foley then says he owes Stone Cold big time and it sounds like Mick's open to giving Austin a title shot, but Mankind has another goal, another dream, and that is the headline the biggest show in the world, WrestleMania. WrestleMania just isn't WrestleMania without Stone Cold, so Mick publicly announces that he wants to defend his belt against Austin this year at the granddaddy of them all. The Rock, Vince and Shane then appear on the stage, and the first order of business is to book DX in a series of matches tonight. This happens every week now, so it's nothing new. What is new though is the Corporate Royal Rumble, a Royal Rumble match featuring D-Generation X and the Corporation. It's every man for himself, the winner will get the number 30 spot in the Royal Rumble match on pay per view, and this corporate version of the Royal Rumble will happen tonight in the Raw main event. The Rock says Mankind never beat him for the WWF title. Mankind needed help from that bald headed jabroni, Steve Austin. Austin's day will come, but right now, Mankind's got Rock's corporate championship belt. The people want and need The Rock to be their WWF champion, so Mankind must give The Rock a shot at the WWF title at the 1999 Royal Rumble pay per view. Mankind says he's already beaten Rock's ass twice, there's no third chances, and Rock just isn't championship material. Rock tries to sweeten the deal with no DQs and no countouts while also promising the corporation won't be at ringside. Mankind continues to refuse while also saying he'll shove Mr. Socko up the Rock's ass, but Rock then says something that gives Mick an idea. Rock says he quits trying to get this match in the ring, and then Mick shouts, I accept. Mankind accepts an I quit match versus the Rock at the Royal Rumble. No DQs, no countouts, no corporation, no knockouts, and no stopping the match for excessive blood loss. Mick says he won't use any submission holds, he's just gonna beat Rock up until Rock says the magic words. And Vince says, hold up, Mankind might not even be the champion at the Royal Rumble pay per view because tonight Mick has to defend his championship against Corporate Kane. Man, we have seen that match a few times too, haven't we? Mick tells Vince to smell what the sock's cooking, and that's our promo over. So we now know our 1999 Royal Rumble title match, and if you've never seen this match before, then trust me, things are going to get pretty violent. On Nitro, the black and white NWO have been shunned once again. Hogan gives a lame excuse and he says the boys clearly didn't get the message, but it really does appear that Hulk Hogan has more important things on his mind. Hogan, the Wolfpack and the black and white walk down to the ring while being escorted by a few biker Michael likers, real biker Michael likers who definitely aren't compensating for anything. And uh, <laughs> check out those pants, <laughs> oh Hollywood. Hogan says he can beat anyone in WCW so he's not worried about Super Brawl. He says he's still gonna run for president while holding the WCW title so yeah, whatever Flair said earlier on, it doesn't really matter. Nash says he's gonna show the world why he's the one and only true giant in tonight's main event, and Scotty Steiner says the NWO's now stronger than ever. Scott's taking on DDP tonight on Nitro, and Scott says he's gonna take Kimberly after the match and show her what it's like to be with a real man. <laughs> Scott then says his bicep's bigger than DDP's leg, maybe it is, and Hogan wraps it up by thanking the Hells Angels for providing the NWO with some backup. You really should have called the DOA, mate. Fuck me, wrestling matches, wasn't expecting that. Rey Mysterio vs Kaz Hayashi on Nitro, New Age Outlaws vs Owen and Jared on Raw. Road Dog doesn't get a chance to speak when the Outlaws get to the ring, Owen must have received special instructions from Big Brother Brett. The winner of this match gets a shot at the tag team titles and it's all New Age Outlaws at the opening bell. Billy Gunn press slams both of his opponents before Road Dog comes in with a back elbow followed by the dancy knee. James then mocks his former best mate with the Jackie Fargo strut, and the hits keep coming with the dancy punch. We then fall into familiar territory with Owen and Jeff singling Jesse James out. Road Dog does prevent Owen from locking in a sharpshooter, but his luck runs out fast when he takes Jeff Jarrett's dropkick right on the dick. That didn't look pleasant. Still, Jesse tags out, as does Jared, and Billy goes to work as usual. Owen takes a Famouser, and that should be the end of the match, but Deborah gets on the apron to distract Badass with her big, massive smile. Billy tells Deborah what she can do with that smile, so Mrs. McMichael changes tactics, she has a word with China, and what do you know, this actually works. 
The outlaws get distracted and Owen manages to win the match via pinfall. We completely miss exactly what happened in the ring, but a replay shows us it was a spinning wheel kick that took Road Dog out. Moves have 10 times more power when you hit them on a distracted opponent, guys. Remember that. Owen and Jared are the number one contenders for the tag team titles. Let's see if they can beat Bossman and Shamrock for the gold in two weeks' time. On Nitro, Kaz Hayashi vs Rey Mysterio goes for 1 minute and 55 seconds. So when this match ends, we've had a total of 5 minutes and 20 seconds of in-ring action since Nitro went on the air. I do like promos in a wrestling show, don't get me wrong, but there definitely needs to be a balance, and maybe, just maybe, this is also a key reason why people would start changing the channel as January rolls on. We'll keep an eye on this in future episodes. The highlight of this match was Kaz flying out of the ring right here and Ray following up with a somersault sent on. The match then ends prematurely when Lex Luger begins walking down the ringside and the total package takes Kaz out before confronting Ray. Lex wants Ray to take the LWO shirt off, Ray refuses, so Lex beats Mysterio up before ripping the shirt off his back. Ray doesn't know when to quit though, he comes back into the ring with a springboard dropkick and he's able to put Lex down with a crossbody, but the total package just annihilates Mysterio again and Ray finds himself in the torture rack. Conan runs down and he tells Lex to quit. Rey Mysterio isn't a target for the NWO and Rey doesn't even have a championship belt so there's no need to go after him. Conan says he's looked after Rey since Mysterio was just 12 years old and he has to look after him again right now. But here comes the rest of the NWO to straighten this whole thing out. Conan wants Kevin Nash's opinion on all this and Nash couldn't care less. Big Sexy laughs at Conan as the NWO beat him down. So k Dog is now officially out of the group. Remember, on Thunder, Hogan said the NWO were trimming the fat, so Conan's the first person to get kicked out of the faction. k Dog gets the red and black colours ripped off his back, he screams for Nash to help him out as Scott Hall uses his trusty kettle prod, and it all ends with Conan getting spray painted with red and black paint just before Nitro goes to commercial break. You've waited for it, it's now here. Gilbert wrestles next on Raw while the Giant cuts a promo on Nitro. Security knock on Gilbert's door and there he is, Dwayne Gill has gone through a character change and it's a character that directly pokes fun at one of WCW's top stars. It's low, it's unnecessary, but it's also absolutely hilarious. And it's only gonna get better from here. Gilbert's mannerisms are so so good and look, he even has his own Goldberg paro as he stands on the rampway. The WWF has spared no expense here. Gilbert begins choking on the paro smoke and he needs to get himself down to the ring. He grabs a microphone and he says, it's not about who's next, it's about who's first. You know, Vince would always talk about not paying attention to the competition and instead, one should focus on improving their own product. Well, Gilbert's living proof that the WWF were paying close attention to WCW. Luna Vachon steps in the ring and right away Gilbert misses a spear. He takes a low blow in the middle of the ring and his attempt at a jackhammer gets countered. It's not going well for Gilbert at all. Luna puts Gilbert away with a splash from the top rope, so the streak begins again. Gilbert is 0 and 1, and no, I'm not keeping track of another streak. The last one was bad enough. Big Jim Dodson has to run in when that Sable superfan tries to attack Luna. Luna and Sable are scheduled to meet at the Royal Rumble, but it looks like this lady wants to give her favourite wrestler an early advantage. Over on Nitro, you can say goodbye to the Giant because this is his final night in WCW. That's right, the Giant's leaving the company and he's another guy who's been here since the very start of reliving the war, more or less. Giant says he's the one true giant of WCW and the NWO, but now it appears that the big man doesn't even want to be part of this reunited new world order. It completely contradicts what was said on Thunder, but anyway, Giant's had enough of Hogan keeping the black and white guys in the dark, so the big man isn't fighting Nash for a spot in the NWO. He's fighting for an opportunity to kick Kevin Nash's ass before coming for the rest of the group. Jan says he's gonna scare the living daylights out of his opponent tonight and after all said and done, he will be the one true immortal giant. By the way, I wanna say hi to my one little fan out there. Hello, Smokey, my cat.
Lenny Lane vs Booker T on Nitro, on Raw, Val Venus is scheduled in a match but it doesn't happen. Before the Raw match, Dennis Knight approaches the announce desk and he's a bit wound up to say the least. Dennis says he's here tonight while speaking incoherently but Cole and Lawler fail to get any more information. The Acolytes show up, they say he's waiting for you and all three men head back up the rampway. That was weird. So Val Venus comes down and he talks about his mate, nothing unusual, but then he notices a pretty lady sitting at ringside and it looks like she's into the big Val Boski. Ken Shamrock then launches an attack from behind and Venus gets beaten up pretty badly. We quickly find out that this lady that Venus approached at ringside is actually Ken Shamrock's sister, and Kenny Boy beats Venus up so much that the next match gets cancelled. Brilliant. Billy Gunn then appears in the ring and he says Shamrock's sister is probably gonna like what she's about to see. No Billy, don't, don't do- ah he did it. Full moon to sister Shamrock. Ken runs down again, a big fight breaks out that includes the boss man and Val Venus. Eventually officials break it up and Shamrock then gives Billy a shot at the IC title at the Royal Rumble. That's funny isn't it? Moon someone's sister and you too can get title opportunities. Shamrock wants to hurt Billy in this upcoming match though and he promises to put BA Billy gun out for good at the Royal Rumble pay per view. Over on Nitro, yeah this is becoming a problem now too isn't it? Those of you who have followed this series from the beginning would know how much I enjoy watching Booker T wrestle, but since losing the TV title and since coming back from injury his matches have been very predictable. His storyline with brother Stevie Ray also seems to start and stop over and over again. So it feels like we're now watching a guy do his thing while hoping someone out there throws him a bone or gives him another break. Lenny Lane vs Booker T is not a competitive match at all both on paper and inside the ring, and even Booker himself doesn't really take this one all that seriously. A bulldog's the only move Mr Lane gets in during the entire match, the rest is all Booker T. The match ends with a spinning back kick followed by a spine buster, Booker doesn't even feel Lenny Lane's worth a top rope move, so he ends it with a Harlem sidekick. Booker wins via pinfall and what can I say, usually the in ring actions are reason to keep watching Nitro but this week it's been pretty bad. X-Pac vs Al Snow's our next match on Raw. On Nitro, Hollywood Hogan and Kevin Nash discuss their infamous match from last week. On Sunday Night Heat, Goldust stole head and that means Mr Snow is now headless. I think this means Goldust has turned heel once again but who knows. X-Pac puts Snow down with an arm drag followed by a dropkick. It goes to the outside where X-Pac lays in a few chops but back in the ring, Pac gets hit with those signature Al Snow headbutts. Waltman tries to explode out of the corner but he gets caught with a tilt award backbreaker. Snow then drops drives his knee into x pocs back while looking for a submission, but the kid gets up and he manages the floor aisle with a quick spinning heel kick. Snow then gets an opportunity to put x pac away following a big power slam, Al goes upstairs for a moonsault but unfortunately he misses his target. So x pac kicks Snow once again and Al's now in position for a bronco buster. x pac hits his signature move just before Goldust shows up and when Al asks for a head back he instead gets whacked in the face. x pac delivers the axe factor, the kid wins via pinfall and Al Snow again begs Goldust to give him his property back but once again he gets smacked with his own mannequin head. Let's hope Goldust doesn't throw head into a wood chipper or something. On Nitro we see a pre-taped video where Nash and Hogan talk about the finger poke of doom. They don't give any deep insight, instead they're on full troll mode as Nash calls it a classic match and Hogan says it really could have gone either way. Hogan says Nash actually almost beat him before the bell even rang. Hogan knew this was going to be the match of the century and Hogan was in awe of Big Sexy inside the Georgia Dome. Nash said his match against Goldberg was a walk in the park compared to the match he had against Hogan. That move that Hogan pulled off, that finger poke, it made Nash go unconscious before he even hit the mat and Kevin wonders what Hogan could do to the Senate and what he could do to Congress if that's the part the Hulkster has in just his finger alone. Hogan knows a thing or two about finger blasting it seems and Nash is lucky to be alive after the finger blasting he took in the Georgia Dome. The CAT scans are negative, the internal bleeding has stopped, he still can't lift his arm properly and for people to say the match was a farce, those people just don't understand how dangerous it really was. Nash can't even recall Hogan pinning him, he was knocked out cold and that's what the tradition of wrestling is all about. Hogan says it was an honour brother, he loves Kevin Nash and the two pretend to cry as the promo comes to an end. Not gonna lie, this was kinda funny. Nash though has way better delivery than Hogan when it comes to these comedy bits.
Kane vs Mankind's our next match on Raw. On Nitro, Big Papa Pump takes on Diamond Dallas Page. Before the match, Kane makes it clear that he wants no help from the corporation in this one, while Vince McMahon makes it clear that the Big Red Machine better win. So the devil's favourite demon wastes little time as the match begins on the outside. The champion's head gets bounced off the ring steps a few times before Kane lifts those same steps to use as a weapon, but Foley puts a stop to that and instead it's Kane who gets whacked a few times. Mick then picks up the steps and he drops them across Kane's back which, considering the bells already rung, should have been a disqualification, but who cares at this point, right? Kane hangs the champion's throat over the top rope before taking it to Mankind in the corner with an uppercut and a headbutt. Mick turns it around with a back elbow and he drops Kane to the mat with a number of right hands to the face. Kane puts a stop to this little flurry though with a big old spine buster. Kane keeps the advantage with a big boot before choking Mankind on the middle rope while tearing at Foley's eyes. He then looks for a backdrop but Mick stops short and he's able to counter with a pile driver. A baseball slide knocks the challenger to the outside and Foley looks to hit a second pile driver, but Kane's able to reverse it and he drives Foley's back into the ring steps. I can't recall ever seeing that before. Back in the ring, Kane takes flight with his top rope clothesline but it only garners a two. He then looks Looks for a choke slam, Mick's able to counter via kick to the dick, and Mankind scores with his double arm DDT. Here comes Mr. Socko as Mankind looks for a mandible claw, but with Kane wearing that mask, it's gonna be kinda difficult for Mankind to do so. The two struggle in the corner, but Kane rises from the mat with Foley on his shoulder, and the challenger plants Mankind with a tombstone pile driver. Looks like we've got ourselves a new champion, guys. Kane makes the cover, but then The Rock runs down to break up the pin attempt, causing Earl Hebner to call for the bell, and it's a disqualification. Rocky then grabs a chair and he cracks Kane right between the eyes before doing the same to Mankind. Both men have been let out as The Rock talks some smack, only to be interrupted by the sound of shattering glass. Stone Cold makes his way down to ringside to a huge pop, The Rock gets distracted, and this allows Foley to grab that chair away from the former champion. Rock gets out of dodge before either Foley and Austin can get their hands on him, so Mick ends up handing the chair to Austin as a kind of peace offering. Stone Cold thanks Mick by dropping him with a stunner before doing the same to Kane. That's gratitude for you. Austin and Rocky then lock eyes on the ramp before going to commercial break. Absolute chaos on Raw's war, and we aren't even halfway through the show yet. On Nitro, the champion of television lets one of the ladies at ringside get a feel of a real man, and truth be told, the poor woman didn't seem to enjoy it all that much. Buff Bagwell loved it though. Scott overpowers Paige on a couple of occasions before Paige is able to take Steiner down with an arm drag. Scott complains to the ref before finally taking control with a side headlock and a shoulder tackle. Both men seem pretty cagey at the start of this one as they continue to feel each other out, but things get a bit more heated when both men slap each other in the face. That's more like it. Scott gets dropped with a shoulder block, Paige's follow up swing and neckbreaker sends Steiner rolling out to the floor, and the NWO lads try a 2 on 1 attack but Dallas is ready for it, connecting with a pair of atomic drops before hitting a double clothesline. Scott gets placed on the top rope, but Buffy Wuffy causes a distraction, allowing Steiner to hit Paige with a clothesline from the middle rope. Scott then sends Paige out to the floor and this allows Buff to choke Paige on the outside. Back in the ring, Scott drops his rather large arm across DDP's chest, all while Buff's mocking Paige on the outside. Big talk for a grown man wearing dungarees. Scott hits a twisting belly to belly, but he only gets a two, a decision which he thoroughly disagrees with as he once again intimidates the referee. All of his sins are forgiven though as he locks in a chin lock before delivering some club and blows to the back. Scott then drops Paige in the corner with a number of right hands, but Dallas gets a rush of adrenaline and he sends Scott into the corner to do the same to him. But Paige gets quickly stopped as Steiner gets a boot up and he delivers another clothesline. Scott keeps the advantage by distracting the referee, allowing Buff to get in more cheap shots. That is, until Dallas fights back with his discus clothesline. Again though, his comeback doesn't last long as Scotty scores with a double underhook powerbomb, but Paige has a lot of heart and he gets back into it following a pancake. Dallas hooks Steiner for the cutter, but Vincent runs in to do Vincent things. This allows Scott to throw Paige into the referee. Buff then throws powder in Paige's eyes. Scott throws Vincent into Paige, and Vincent gets hit with the diamond cutter. It's all go here in the finish of this match, folks. In the midst of all this confusion, Steiner lays DDP out with a chair shot before locking in the recliner. Buff revives the referee, and Scott Steiner wins this one via referee stoppage. Maybe the finish was a little overbooked, but I didn't mind it too much as DDP got put over super strong while fighting against the odds. We did actually get a winner on WCW television here too, so that's always a bonus.
Goldberg delivers a promo from his locker room and there's quite a few of these in between our next matches tonight, so let's just cover them all in one go. Goldberg said the mistake he made at Starcade was believing his match would be a fair one on one fight, but people who prosper learn from their mistakes and Goldberg won't get caught slipping again. Later on, he says Nash didn't impress him much, Scott Hall's a loser, and Goldberg admits that Lex Luger took him by surprise inside the Georgia Dome. The question is then, who's next? Scott Hall isn't next, Scott Hall's first. The streak begins once again at sold out and Goldberg tells the bad guy not to be late this Sunday for the pay per view. It's kinda funny how this week both Goldberg and Goldberg said who's first. D-Generation X's Triple H takes on the Brood's Edge next on Raw, on Nitro, Eric Bischoff sets up the Nitro wrestling ring. On the USA Network, you quickly realize that these two men are going to be at the forefront of the company in just a few short years time, time goes by so fast. Both men exchange right hands in the corner before Edge hits the mat following a back elbow from the leader of DX. Hunter looks to deliver a number of punches to the head while perched on the middle rope, but Edge counters and Triple H gets dropped face first into the top turnbuckle. Edge then hits a spinning wheel kick, he chokes Hunter out, he delivers a clothesline and a big tasty flopjack, only scoring a 2 for his efforts. He then misses a stinger splash in the corner, to be fair copying anything from WCW at this point was always gonna fail, and Hunter knocks Edge down with a hearty raised knee before connecting with his facebreaker knee smash for a near fall of his own. Edge counters a pedigree attempt and he catapults Hunter into the turnbuckles. He looks to take advantage with a swinging neckbreaker but Triple H counters it and Edge ends up taking Hunter's finisher. Hunter wins on Raw's war and I thought the finish to this one was really well done. Following the bell, the rest of the brood come down to put a beating on Triple H as the lights flicker in the arena. They eventually go out and when the lights come back on, the road dogs magically appeared at ringside and he's covered in a… mysterious red liquid? Is that YouTube friendly enough? The hardcore champ's the latest recipient of the brood's bloodbath, so he better have some spare gear with him for that Royal Rumble later on. On Nitro, we see a pre-recorded video of Eric Bischoff setting up the ring earlier this evening with Klondike Bill. When you get done with this video, look up some Klondike Bill stories on YouTube, Tony Schiavone's got quite a few. You know, I actually find this kind of stuff fascinating, I know this is supposed to be Eric's punishment and whatnot, but seeing the ring getting set up and seeing a small piece of Nitro coming together before it goes live on air, it's really interesting to me. Eric has to lay the mats down in the ring, he has to carry the ropes and turnbuckle pads to the ring, he's being very sarcastic to Bill while Bill's giving as good as he gets, and what you want to pay attention to is this part right here. Eric's tightening up the turnbuckles by hand and it's taking him a bit too long, so he uses a wrench to speed things up. Seems like nothing at the moment, but do remember this for later on. Dennis Knight gets chosen next on Raw, on Nitro it's Bam Bam Bigelow vs Scott Hall. The bad guy comes to the ring and he makes fun of Goldberg by saying the end of Starcade was a shocker, very good. Scott watched Goldberg's little promos backstage and Scott says Goldberg was right, he did make a big mistake by crossing the wolf pack. Hall brings the survey back right here, it's been a while, he wants to know who wants to see Goldberg get shocked this Sunday and Scott gets a decent pop, looks like plenty of fans want to see Billy Boy get zapped at sold out. That toothpick spot hasn't been working well for Scott recently, has it? The bad guy gets floored not once but twice and after Hall softens up Bigelow's arm, he gets sent to the mat once again. Bam Bam gets suckered in with a test of strength and he ends up taking a corner clothesline. Scott gets his receipt in the form of a big splash in the corner, but Bigelow misses a headbutt and Scott has another chance. Unfortunately for Scott, Bam Bam shakes it off and the beast from the east hits two clotheslines followed by a vertical suplex. The crowd then notice someone coming down to the ring and look, it's Disco Inferno and he's holding the kettle prod. Someone else also runs down to the ring, Raph shows up to push Bigelow off the top rope, but Bigelow is able to fight back and Wrath gets knocked back down. While this attack happened, Disco gave Scott Hall the kettle prod and Scott's able to give Bam Bam a little shock treatment. Hall wins via pinfall and does this mean Disco's now actually part of the wolf pack? He celebrates with Hall and it looks like Hall's pretty happy with how things turned out, so I guess we'll find out next week. 
On Raw, we're met with the sound of druids chanting inside the arena as we get a shot of the Undertaker's symbol at the entranceway. The camera then pans to Dennis Knight dropped at an altar surrounded by the Acolytes. Why they showed the Undertaker's chair before Dennis Knight, I don't know, it kinda ruins the surprise. But the druids make their way out and look at this, it must have been this guy's first night on the job as he has no idea where he's meant to be going. Bless him. The gong then sounds and the lights go out, signalling the arrival of the Undertaker. We haven't seen the dead man since he was buried alive at rock bottom, but here he is live and in living colour. Taker sits on his symbol shape throne and a pre tape promo begins to play over the PA. Down in a grave as if it would be my final resting place, filling it with the earth's rotting soil. They tried to destroy me, wishing I would just go away. But what is it? What have they really done? The simple minds of mortal men. They've sent me back to the place that is my origin. Destroy me. The more they try, the more powerful I've become. And now, I've risen from my earthy grave. And now I will slay the ones I once saved. The reckoning is upon us. The day that the Ministry of Darkness seizes the land. Destroys all that you hold dear. Make playthings of your heroes and devour your innocence. The power of darkness shall be offered only to a chosen few. And those that resist the temptations of my ministry, pain becomes synonymous with punishment. So let my servants be few and secret. They shall rule the many and the known. For I am the weeper of men, the chaser of souls, the weaver of nightmares. I am the heart of darkness. I am now and ever will be the purity of evil. Yes, hell has relocated to Earth. Undertaker then rises from his chair and he makes his way towards our poor friend Dennis. The dead man begins speaking in tongues. Anal, Nathrach. Speaking in tongues. And this is where things start to get a bit crazy. So crazy that I can't show this on YouTube. The Undertaker makes a cut along his wrist. He pours some of that red liquid into a goblet. Taker then says that this man on the altar will no longer be known as Dennis Knight, but he shall be now known as Midian. Our newly christened friend takes a drink from the goblet. And <laughs> yes, this is a real thing that happened on WWF television. As if this segment couldn't get any more crazy, Taker then takes a knife from Paul Bearer and he carves his symbol in the Midian's chest. It's… <laughs> it's something for sure, isn't it? Undertakers went from spooky to a little dark to absolutely demonic and hey, as crazy as this all is, it does a great job of reinforcing just how evil and sinister this new Undertaker really is. Lightning then strikes one of the symbols on the stage and as it burns, Midian begins to levitate above the altar. And then we just go to commercial break and Raw carries on as normal. This is the true origin of the Ministry of Darkness and this whole segment was to show just what being buried alive has done to the Undertaker. He's now more evil and more dangerous than ever before and it will be interesting to see how all this plays out. On Raw, D'Lo cuts a promo along with Terry and Jackie. On Nitro, it's Kurt Hennig vs Ric Flair. Hennig lands the first shot as he takes Flair down with a shoulder block but the president of WCW sends Hennig to the outside following a slap to the face. When Kurt gets back inside, the two exchange chops in the corner before Rick gets sent skywards with a big back body drop. That's the cue for Barry Windham to make his way down the ringside but he's immediately followed by the truly terrifying image of David Flair. So scary in fact that Nitro has to take a commercial break. When we come back, it's Rick in control, putting Hennig on the mat with a back elbow before heading to the top rope. 
Predictable results ensue as the nature boy gets sent flying before Hennig decides to humiliate Flair by popping on the president's own figure four leg lock. The hold stays applied for quite some time as the fans try to rally behind the nature boy to get back in the match, and Flair does eventually break it with a thumb to the eye before dropping a knee that looks suspiciously low. The two exchange more chops in the corner before Flair gets sent up and over to the outside, landing at the feet of his son David. Hennig intimidates Flair Jr, no mean feat I'm sure you'd all agree, and both Rick and Kurt continue to slug it out on the floor before Flair goes low. Flair delivers another chop and Hennig takes his signature backflip bump, you love to see it, and back in the ring Kurt takes a delayed vertical suplex from the nature boy. The two get up and Slick Rick sends Hennig flying out of the ring and right at the feet of David. Davy Boy Flair thinks about whacking Kurt, but he takes too long and he ends up getting clobbered from behind by Barry Windham. Rookie mistake right there, kid. Rick sees Red. He takes care of Windham with a smack across the face. He then throws Kurt back inside the ring and he connects with a chop lock before locking in the figure four. The crowd's loving it, they want Kurt to top out, but here comes Barry Windham and the match ends in disqualification. Both Hennig and Windham look for a double clothesline, but David trips them up from the outside and he slides a chair into the ring. This forces Kurt and Barry to bail and that's how it ends, folks. Another DQ isn't brilliant, but I can at least understand this one. You know, they kinda need to keep both guys protected for the pay per view this Sunday, so I can let them away with this one. Just about. Over on Raw, Dilo says he's came out to apologize to Terry. He told Terry he'll do whatever she wants, including doing her laundry and driving her around anywhere she needs to go. But what Terry wants Dilo to do tonight is totally wrong. Dilo says he's not gonna do it, whatever it is. And Terry says Dilo did say he'd do anything. So Dilo quickly caves in and he says, okay, let's do it, let's get it over with. Mark Henry's music then plays, and clearly Terry wants Dilo to fight his best mate. Mark says that he's not gonna do it, so Jackie pushes Dilo into Mark, and just when Mark was about to fight back, Terry hits him with a low blow. China and Sammy then walk down to the ring, and China shoves Jackie to the mat. Mark then gets escorted back up the ramp, sore balls and all. And backstage, China tells Sammy to look after Mark while the ninth wonder of the world fetches him a drink. Riveting stuff. Dear Stone Cold Steve Austin, you son of a bitch. My son Shane has been making sure I'm in great shape for the Royal Rumble match, and my God, I can't wait to slap the shit out of you at the pay-per-view. I've been running in the snow just like Rocky Balboa in Rocky IV. I've been wearing a gigantic stupid coat that's very difficult to move in. And look, I've even took a break from choking my chicken to catch a real-life chicken. Hell, I even stopped beating my own meat so I could beat up some real meat in a cold-ass refrigerator. When I face you at the Royal Rumble, pal, I swear to God, I'm gonna fuck you up. You're looking at a real man now, Steve. Not a little bitch like Shawn Michaels, or a crybaby like Bret Hart. I'll see you at the pay-per-view, Austin. Mark my words, pal, you have no chance in hell of winning the Royal Rumble match. Our main events this week then, we have got the Giants final WCW match when he takes on Kevin Nash on Nitro, on Raw we have got a corporate Raw Rumble match. Michael Buffer calls this Nitro main event the battle of the super big men, that's very catchy. The Giant comes out all alone while Kevin Nash brings Scott Hall along for some moral support. The two lads allow each other to pose before locking up in the middle of the ring. Big Kev grabs a handful of the Giant's hair as he backs him into a corner, and as Kevin looks for a cheap shot on the break, Giant blocks it and Nash takes a headbutt. Giant lands a number of kicks to the midsection before hitting a clothesline and a hard chop. Kevin returns the favor though as he connects with a clothesline of his own. A big boot scores Kevin a near fall, he then distracts the ref as Hall chokes the Giant over the middle rope, and this allows Kev to hit his leapfrog body guillotine, the big teabag. Nash stays in control with more right hands in the corner before laying in a few knee strikes, and Kev then sizes his opponent up for the big back elbow. Hall again makes his presence felt as he punches the giant in the back of the head before Big Sexy shows off his power by delivering a picture perfect body slam to the giant. Another big boot to the face sends giant to the mat and Nosh signals for the jackknife. He has it hooked, but the giant's able to rush Nosh into the corner and then drop him with another big clothesline. Hall tries to intervene once again, but this time it backfires as both he and Big Sexy get sent into the corner. They both get squished with a splash, followed by some sexy swivel hip. Uh, 
uh, ass thrusts. Yeah, Nash rolls to the floor, but Scott isn't so lucky. The bad guy takes a choke slam, and the giant then goes to retrieve Nash. Remember Eric Bischoff's wrench from earlier on? Yeah, Big Kev's got it in his hand. Nash cracks the giant over the head with the weapon, and that's enough to secure Big Sexy the pin and the win. The giant does the J-O-B in his final Nitro match ever. Paul jabs the big man with the kettle prod while the rest of the NWO celebrate in the ring. They then turn the giant over before spray painting the letters NWO on his back. Paul White's contract with WCW would expire on the 8th of February 99 and he chose to leave the company, ending a near four year spell with World Championship Wrestling. White would state on an episode of the Monday Night War series on WWE Network that he was making a fraction of what the main eventers were making, and his salary wasn't increased after putting in a request. So, after a World War 3 win, 3 tag team title reigns and 2 World Heavyweight title runs, the giant is no longer in WCW. It's time for the corporate Royal Rumble match. The winner becomes the 30th entrant in the real Royal Rumble in a few weeks time. Shane McMahon brings the number one entrant Ken Shamrock to the ring before joining the commentary table. And in at number two, it's BA Billy Gunn. Shamrock's so eager to get his hands on Billy that he throws himself over the top rope and he eliminates himself. This makes no sense at all because one, Billy hadn't entered the ring and therefore the match shouldn't have even started. And two, if Shamrock just waited like 10 seconds, Billy would have gotten inside the ropes anyway. Anyway, and the two could have brawled until their hearts were content. Shamrock's been eliminated, but he hangs around until the big boss man arrives. Badass pulls off a Shawn Michaels like running forearm to keep the boss man at bay, but Billy's in deep trouble just before the fourth entrant comes out. It's Test. The two members of Team Corporate beat Billy up, but they're unable to eliminate him. So here comes X Pac next to help out his fellow degenerate. Waltman and the boss man go at it while Test eliminates Billy with a hip toss over the top rope. We're back to a two on one situation right now, with X Pac getting annihilated by the corporation. But things get a bit more even when Road Dog enters the corporate Royal Rumble next, and look, he's all fired up after that bloodbath and he did not bring any new gear. Speaking of being all fired up, here comes the big red machine, always a game changer. Kane steps into the corporate Royal Rumble and he eliminates Jesse James almost right away. And now X Pac has to deal with three guys wanting to cause him as much pain as humanly possible. Fear not, young Waltman, because here comes your leader, Triple H, the final entrant in this Royal Rumble. And his first order of business is to take Test's head off with a clothesline, Jesus Christ. Kane holds Triple H for Test to get in a free shot, but the plan backfires, resulting in Kane eliminating Test. This immediately gets followed up with Hunter and Pac eliminating Kane, and the big boss man then quickly eliminates Waltman. This series of quick eliminations means we're already down to the final two, Bossman and Triple H. But we've got a surprise entrant in this corporate Royal Rumble, and it's Vince McMahon. McMahon wants to claim that number 30 spot, and he waits for just the right moment to get in and send Hunter and Bossman out of the ring. Vince McMahon's won the corporate Royal Rumble, and look, he's even doing his very best Hulk Hogan impersonation. What a guy. Vince forgot, though, that there's another member of D-Generation X. That, of course, being the ninth wonder of the world, China. The roof comes off the building when China walks down to the ring, and this must mean that China's also taking part in the real Royal Rumble match on pay-per-view. Patterson and Briscoe try to stop China entering the ring, China takes the Stooges out with forearms, the glass shatters, the roof comes off the building again, and Steve Austin distracts Vince long enough for China to dump McMahon over the top rope. So not only will China make history at the Royal Rumble as the first woman to ever enter the match, she'll also enter the Royal Rumble at number 30. Austin remains at number 1, while McMahon still has to enter at number 2. Raw wins reliving the war this week. Nitro's lack of in-ring action during our number one or so really hurt the show overall, and for the go-home show leading into Sold Out this week, it just wasn't that good. Consider this, after watching these shows today, which would you be more excited for, Sold Out or the Raw Rumble? Yeah, I thought so. Raw's now on 83 points, Nitro's on 67, and we've got 18 ties on the board. Both shows scored well in the TV ratings. Raw wins with a 5.5, while Nitro got a 5.0. 
sold out 99s next up on our timeline. Please join me this Sunday and we'll see what happens at the pay-per-view. We've got Jericho vs Saturn, Lex Luger vs Conan, Rick and David Flair vs Kurt Hennig and Barry Windham, and of course we've got the stun gun ladder match between Scott Hall and Bill Goldberg. Take care of yourselves out there guys, and as always, thank you for watching another episode of Reliving the War. No chance, so that's what you got.